Watercolor is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. Wait, that's love. But sometimes it's watercolor too. Sometimes. Hello, all you beautiful minders out there. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. This, I felt like, was a necessary episode and maybe, hopefully, will be useful. I recently did this landscape. Even before I started, I was wrestling with the values, the value scheme. I had a picture that wasn't really great. Me and my wife went out to this historical location. Uh, it was a frontier location back in the 1700s. But I've done a couple studies and I thought I wanted to do a painting and I almost gave up on the idea. And then I thought, no, you know, Steve, you need to practice what you preach. Failure is a teacher. Anyway, I went through this painting and I had frustration after frustration. A lot of them were self-inflicted. Some of them were maybe just not great reference material due to a lackluster picture. Number of problems, number of issues. But I pushed through it because it was important what I learned. And I hope maybe you'll gather some encouragement and some ideas from my commentary because I'm going to comment as we go through this on the frustrations that I faced and the problems that I faced. Now, I think I rescued the painting in the end. I think it could have been done a lot better, but I think I rescued it to a salvageable state. But I don't want you to focus on how good or, you know, if you're a beginner, whether you think, oh, I could never achieve that. Don't even think along those lines, okay? I want you to listen to the frustrations I had and how I dealt with them and how I pushed through some of the humps. Even if you don't see that they might have been humps, okay? Um, I've had a lot of experience in rescuing bad art, okay? I was an illustrator for, been an illustrator for over 30 years, so I've had to do that a lot. And I know a lot of tricks and I, I can see a little further down the road than someone who's just starting out and what can be done. So, um, I have that experience. Uh, you don't get that unless you've done it, unless you've pushed through those humps. Whether or not the final piece turns out to be something you want to hang or share or do anything with but throw in the trash pile. I hope this episode will be valuable for that aspect and I'll try to give you as many tips and thoughts with how I dealt with various things as I go through. And I hope if you have any questions, you'll ask this question. I opened the windows back here because it had been snowing and I thought it might be a nice, nice mood setter, but it stopped. So Reese is back there staring out, hoping it'll snow again, I think. Why, I don't know. He never goes outside. Anyway, on to the demo. All right, so I'm painting this painting today on Stonehenge Aqua. This is a block, 140 pound cold press block. These are my reference photos. I took one lighter uh, to get more of the details and I took one darker to get more of the contrast. And that's pretty common with what I'll do to a photo after I've taken it. You can see the lack of real sun and dynamic shadows here. I tried these studies. Now the perspectives are way off on this. <clears throat> these were value studies and color studies. So I was just trying to see what kind of challenges I was going to be up against. You have several facets on the building and they all sit against a background. So that presented a lot of contrast challenges. I was unsure at several points how I was going to handle it. I'm sketching my building out here and getting this all ready to go. Uh, on buildings, perspective is key. It's very, very important. You got to get that right. Doesn't matter if you're going to paint the building loose. You have to have some semblance of correct perspective in my opinion. Um, now I did treat this building fairly tight but uh, even the looser buildings, uh, if you look at the really good loose uh, urban painters and building painters, they still have the perspective at least convincing. So working through the value challenges I knew that these windows were going to need to be light and I needed to apply washes directly through them. So I masked them off. So I'm just using liquid frisket there. And that was a rubber applicator tip. And I started on my backgrounds. I now get into problem number one. I quickly lost control of these background washes. I envision a much more spontaneous 
background merging with the foreground and it just really got away from me. Thankfully the saving grace was that none of it was too dark and I had some matting um, options you know on what I could mat out in the front ground for front foreground. Looked at it trying to figure out what to do I decided to start working layers um, and negative paint around the building. I know I needed a lot of dark contrast for the building so I thought okay we'll just kind of work to that uh, theory and start darkening those backgrounds. I did it gradually so that I had some adjustment room. Another problem. I felt like I just treated the building a little bit too intensely. Uh, I don't think it was a nat natural color. Um, there's nothing wrong with bright colors if that's what you're going for. I was not. And the other thing is I usually like to leave things like buildings to last till my background and foreground are determined, you know, the values. Because it helps me. Why I abandoned that in this case, I do not know. Maybe I was just tired this day. Um, and I just didn't think through what it was. I just kind of let my intuition take me. And my intuition, I don't think, was very good this day. So, anyway. Another problem. I went way too warm, I felt, on this facade. This needed to be dark to contrast where the light was coming from off to the upper left. But it was in shadow and it wasn't intense and didn't need to be intense. So why I made it an intense, more intense color, I do not know. You'll see later I'll point out that I went back and adjusted that color. And I'm just cleaning up some edges here, or at least trying to. Um, I had just some wash encroachment on the building that I didn't really want. Again, that's something I knew better on how to handle the washes. I just was trying to have some sort of unified look in the washes and then negative paint, but it didn't work out that way. Um, so I'm going to try to do something with this foreground and uh, add a little bit of texture and make some interesting shapes and little values here. I'll got it, again, I'm treading sort of a thin line because I don't want to overdo the foreground. Everything is already starting to look overworked. And the wet and wet washes are not presenting anything really lovely. So um, I'm, I'm kind of adjusting to that. Uh, here I'm using a cooler wash on the building to bring that intensity down. Um, it still didn't bring it down all that much. In the end, I'm just going to live with it. Because if the more I try to adjust that facade, the darker it will get. The more paint you apply, it just gets darker. That's what makes watercolor so frustrating to correct sometimes. My mindset at this point is, you know, this is probably going to turn out to be nothing. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and practice and use this as opportunities in the individual parts. And that's a suggestion, a tip that I have. When a painting is failing, then pick out parts to use as practice. I mean, it's watercolor paper. Don't throw it away just because you don't have a finished piece. You see here I'm stippling in another layer of yet darker um, greenery. And this is about as dark as I can go. So I wanted to take that step with a layer of darker trees and foliage around the building especially on that dark facade side to see how that would affect the overall values. Now this tree I was pretty happy with. I felt like it was fresh, loose, spontaneous. Um, I did add some edge detail as you will see um, and I tried to keep it still within the detailed look of this painting. But I was pretty happy overall with this tree so that's a win and that's what I'm getting at you know when you have these paintings that you're afraid might fail 
press through because the learning might be key. Just put out of your mind that you're going to end up with a finished painting. And instead just say, okay, how would I paint that tree? How would I do this? How would I detail that? How would I texture this? And so that's what I did. I thought I still have room to make this background work. And that's what I did. I started working these trees in layers. Now in my photo reference, these trees were not this dark, but it works. I thought it was okay. And here I'm just trying to add some interest to this foreground to kind of unify everything. And again, I'm, I'm trying to keep in mind not to overdo it. Not even knowing if this will work at this point. But I think in the end, you know, I added a little patch, grassy patch of texture here. This wasn't in the photo reference, so it was just sort of out of my head. And I think it worked okay. I always look for opportunities. Opportunities I hadn't planned on. So some of the lighter areas under the tree that I painted on the left side left a nice uh, occasion for putting vertical tree trunks. And I really felt like um, I was able to make this tree line work pretty well. Here I'm extend extending a second layer of tree foliage uh, out to the right. And again, I'm strengthening some of those vertical tree trunks just to make that all look like a deep wooded area behind there which it was. Some of those vertical tree trunk lines I feel like just add a nice rhythm design element to the painting so I was encouraged by being able to put those in and it seeming like it worked. Although some of it looks a little muddy and overworked. Here you can see me adding a lighter tree uh, line behind the house behind this building. The building was actually used as a fort, you know, in historical terms. That's why they had these these wood shutter. This was in a frontier area of upstate South Carolina, and this was for a, a fairly remote local community. And uh, local farmers and tradesmen would come here if they felt in danger. There were times in history when uh, Indians were attacking and ransacking villages along the frontier. So that's what this building was. Bringing the value down on the roof, giving it a cool sort of a tin roof look. From the stark white. That, I could have masked that out too, but it was fairly easy to paint around. You can see the tree trunks off to the right. I have those uh, masked off as well. I'll zoom in here a little bit and let you see. Now that foliage that overlaps the house, that was another issue, another problem that was discouraging. Uh, I debated on whether to paint around some white spots on the building, but that would have been difficult. And, and I'm going to have to rebuild the values there so you can tell that's foliage. It just looks like a mistake. I'm just adding a highlight here along that roof line to make that edge of that roof look crisp and stand out slightly against those dark trees in the background. Scraping like this you do lightly with a very sharp knife. Now I'm pulling up all the frisket and we're going to fill in the values on the parts that were masked. Uh, that's a rubber cement pickup. It's a great way to pull off liquid frisket that's been dried. And now I have uh, window shapes and a tree to paint on. There was a heavy gradation on this tree. Very light on the left, very dark on the right. So I needed a white, bright white surface to paint on. And I started by filling the left tree first, the left tree trunk first with a wash keeping the whole area wet and then charging deeper pigment on the right. This was a gray that I mixed. It was just sort of uh, greens and reds and a little Payne's gray mixed together to make sort of a warm neutral gray. 
And as the wash dries, the charging spreads less and less. And so I keep building the shadow side. And I dab in a little bit here and there for texture. Note how the trees darken as they go up under the canopy of foliage. That's a good realistic observation to make. It makes it look like they're not cut out and they're just going up inside that foliage. So I'm pretty happy with the tree trunks. Now I'm just down into noodling detail and seeing how I can make this whole thing come together. I tried to stipple in just some ground texture and some shapes, you know, for leaves and little patches of grass here and there. Again, trying to be careful not to overdo it. It's such a temptation. And I probably should have left that little clump of grass alone. At this point, you know, I'm I'm putting in detail that's superfluous and in some cases unnecessary. It's an even greater temptation when you feel like um, the painting did not turn out the way you originally envisioned. Now I'm just cleaning up around these windows where the frisket was. Friskets will sometimes leave a raggedy edge, so I'm just going to clean it up before I add value to these shutters on the window. Like heavy wood shutters that are hinged. And I have to bring the value on these windows down. Even though they're lighter, I need to make them look like they're in shadow. I'll add a little tone even to the side windows. Now it's time to start detailing in some of the stone. And... This is a stone wall on these buildings, um, but you know the key is to add enough detail so that you suggest it. Your naked eye, unless you just have really good vision, won't pick up every stone. It'll pick up the ones that give the most contrast. And so I'm trying to hint at the stone texture without drawing in every stone. To do that would just look unnatural. It would just look over-rendered. Hinting at detail is better, always better, uh, for perception than, I think, than actually drawing it all in. And even doing it some on the side. On the side in shadow, though, you have to be careful because shadow usually uh, lowers the contrast. So you want, even be, you want to be even more subtle. Adding in the hinges on the shutters and just... Uh, cleaning up some other detail. We're getting close now to being done. Now I'm going to rebuild these little foliage sections here that just look like a mistake and got too dark and ended up having to paint right through them. But I wanted the foliage to look like it overlapped the building. So what I'm going to use is uh, Kryla acrylic gouache. Um, and you can thin this down and it will dry permanent. It's gouache because it dries matte. Very, very matte and flat. So it retains a little bit of tooth. It doesn't come out to be the shiny. There you can see I've already done most of it. And so I rebuilt those values. Now I'm glazing over them. So it has the same effect as if you had painted right on paper, you know, glazed over paper. If I were to mix the green in an opaque uh, color, it doesn't look quite the same. It doesn't look. And this at least uh, still looks like it was painted on watercolor paper. I mean, if you look close, you can tell. But I was able to rebuild that area, the highlights in that area of the foliage, and make it look like it overlaps the building. Now some final texture detail here. The spatter. I do it with some red-brown and some green. And what I do is I take some clear water in my brush, and I'll just touch the edge of a few dots just to make them spread a tiny, tiny bit. 
spatter or something else you don't want to overdo. Well, there we have it. Um, not a bad salvage. Not as fresh, not as spontaneous as I wanted it to look, but when you mat it out, all in all, it's it's acceptable. Um, I may try this again. Uh, I think what I'd rather do is go out on location and take some better pictures of this complex. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned some tips and hope you are inspired to press through. Press through and see what you can learn. Thanks everybody for watching and uh, thank you so much patrons for your support contributions. You're making this channel happen. We'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.